Are you drinking coffee out of a just a tall plastic cup? Yeah. What am I supposed to drink it out of? A coffee mug. It's iced. Oh, oh, oh <laughs> fancy pants. <laughs> That's right. Call my eyes, Pierre Escargo. Uh, you fucking belong in this movie because you're a rich <laughs> bourgeois shit. Okay, I'm a. I'm ready to talk about that. Okay, count me in, Coach. What's up, nerds? Welcome back to Region <laughs> Free. I'm under attack for my dog Cloud Moser. He wants to be on the podcast. Um, no, he's not. Uh, I am AJ Moser, of course. Always joined by my best friend Blake Hester, whom I never Hello. disagree with, whom we're always on the same page about, who we never. Hello have an argument or see things differently or interpret media in different ways um and this is a podcast about exactly that that's true despite the multiple years age difference between myself and you of me being 28 you being 35 that's right uh i do believe we are from the same mother born the same day of the same brain (laughs) (laughs) this dog is he does not want me podcasting tonight um look on this show, our goal is talking about underseen, underappreciated kind of freak movies that deserve a second look, maybe a first look because they just went under the radar. But sometimes we're going to buck tradition. We're going to break from the norms and just talk about a movie right. we fucking want to talk about uh, or th- well, thought we wanted to talk about. Um, look, at, at the time of recording... Uh, Brandon Cronenberg's Infinity Pool has just splashed onto store shelves, um, swung Mm -hmm. into cinemas around the country, and we felt like it would be a good one for us to tee up a nice little warm-up discussion just to get the old uh, podcast muscles lubricated and and ease back into this tradition. And what better way to sort of warm up with a new release than one that towed the line of the very... uh, sensuous and dangerous nc-17 rating it was an under the radar Mm -hmm. decision this film uh they had to cut about half a second of a dick out at the last minute to to sneak (laughs) into theaters around the world there's a really good new york times article uh an interview with cronenberg's quoted in it but then it's mainly with this guy who runs like a production company that helps negotiate the ratings of movies down from nc-17s yeah it, it was uh I think it was called like the the battle for an R rating, but it was a really insightful and interesting oh. interview. If the New York Times weren't class traders that put all their stuff behind a paywall, I would go read that. I will. Uh, I will tweet that one out with a. Is, <laughs> link is this article. a good place? Is this a good place for me to speak this into the world uh, as a person who writes for a print publication? I, I think, think so. paywalls on. I think I think putting news behind paywalls is a crime. I think news outlets should not put their websites beyond paywalls. But pay for the physical edition. I understand. Yeah. I but, am... like, you put ads on your website. Why are you asking me for money? It's like how Vox.com's like, oh, you want to make a donation? I'm like, bro, don't you have deals with Geico? Get out of my face. I'm not contributing to you, Ezra Klein. There was one of the – and this is – I mean, we're really going in circles. One of the craziest <laughs> things that happened recently was someone was like – uh with you know the 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 george santos guy who just lied his way into congress everyone Mm -hmm. was like how did how did journalists not report on this and someone's worse i think it was good old mikey b who's now you know an enemy a competitor in in our podcasting space so i feel comfortable calling him out uh but he was like well you know maybe if more people paid for journalism we would be able to publish stuff about that not really how it works uh and not relevant to this podcast whatsoever but uh Fuck, today we're talking about Brandon Cronenberg's Infinity Pool. <laughs> Little baby B-boy Cronenberg has got a new motion picture swinging into store shelves, like we said. Right. Uh, we've both right. seen it. Hopefully mm-hmm. you, the listener, has seen it. Or just want to know if it's worth your, I was going to say five bucks. Movies do not cost five bucks these days. It's like yeah, no, seventeen fifty. Yeah, I think this cost me a solid eight dollars. No refreshments. <laughs> And, unfortunately, I had to pee halfway through, and I didn't get that money back for the time I spent in the Ah, bathroom. Well, you know what Jimmy C. would say? Go see it again. Jimmy Carter? James Cameron. Oh, I haven't seen that movie either. You should. I've seen some James Cameron movies. Yeah. Uh, Not an underseen director, by any means. You know, this this movie could have been called Infinity Pool, The Way of Water, because they do get wet. There's a lot of substances, fluids. Yeah. It's a moist a moist pick for sure. And honestly, 
for the build up to the unsimulated cum shot, the R cut, it's a really disappointing cum shot. It's like the most pitiful little cum I've ever seen. He, Alexander Skarsgård might be a big sexy man, but he is lacking in yeah. the protein department. We did, you know, we did. We haven't we haven't got into it too much off mic yet, but uh, we did talk about the just globby nature of that cum shot. A real letdown. Yeah. Is is that is that Skarsgård's cum? I don't know. I didn't I do if he had a dick stand in. I didn't do my full uh, journalistic duty and, and investigate who's come well set was. it up set it up i'm gonna look that up alex yeah um so brandon cronenberg is obviously the son of the you know acclaimed body horror and all-around great director david cronenberg um he had a movie called antiviral like a decade ago um but yeah. then sort of really made a splash on the scene with possessor which came out i think like 2021 like kind of came out during the pandemic and it was another one of those movies that like did sort of sneak out with like an unrated cut because it went straight to like vod streaming services and so that's a gnarly fucking movie um i think i think we both like that one yeah i think it's really good i think it's like not as deep as it thinks it is Mm. but like as a good kind of crime thriller somewhat pseudo sci-fi e it's really cool it honestly feels like a assassin's creed movie it definitely (laughs) does um I think a lot of that, you know, thematically sort of carries over to this where it's like feasibly kind of set in the real world, but also introduces some real kind of out there elements that are like I did. He kind of talked about like Ray Bradbury and Philip K. Dick being sort of broad inspirations for how he writes this kind of stuff where it's just like little elements that almost seem magical are definitely like Mm -hmm. unfamiliar to our world and how we understand logic and reality to operate but these little twists that kind of just you don't you don't interrogate too much because the movie very confidently introduces them and it's like look for example in this one there is a pool that you immerse yourself in and it creates uh an identical double of you yeah and the movie is not interested in exploring it beyond that definition which i both respect and also think it's not good enough to like be able to just be like here's what it is let's move on except this is the lore of the world it's very matter of fact it's like by the way we can clone you so <laughs> we got the rest of the movie to get through so we're gonna move on real quick yeah point now. um i liked this movie a lot more than you did is what sure. i understand um sure. i think i probably like this more than possessor as well just wow off off the first jump it it has like I okay. really, really liked watching this movie. And then I saw it Thursday night, so it's been a few days. Um, right. And I think, you know, I've, like, settled into definitely liking this movie, but I had a really energizing experience watching it. I had a really great crowd where, like, people were reacting to the, the right moments with, like, Egad! Oh, no! Yikes! <laughs> Egad Don't show me shucks. that! Yeah, shucks! G Willikers! <laughs> um, and I was sitting there laughing like a little pervert cackling like a king uh during some of the the gnarly stuff in this movie um so i had a i I had a different viewing experience where actually i walked into the theater and there was only one other guy there and i was like oh (laughs) more people just shuffle in but it was very empty theater i also i was going with uh my friend of the show jason daphnis who also is a little freak. You can tell him I said that. Yeah. He's a little per- pervert, man. Um, and I was like, great, me and Jason will go see a little freak movie. Little did I know he was inviting his very normal girlfriend and a friend of hers I had never met. And so I did have anxiety throughout the whole movie where for every cum shot and lactating breast and body being Lots of full frontal mid- nudity. Yeah, every time we just saw Mia Goth naked tearing someone in half, I was like, oh, I wonder what they're thinking of that movie a few seats down from <laughs> me right now. <laughs> there's um, uh, there's a shot towards the end where I thought the movie was really going to go out on that individual frame, and I was getting ready mm-hmm. to log on to Letterboxd and be like, uh, an incredible closing shot um, with the... Let's just say it involved some breastfeeding. I was like, that is a bold way to end your movie. Movie goes on it's true. a few more minutes other than that. But I was like, we, we're, we've we gotten somewhere very great very quickly. Not very quickly. Did you ever watch, did you ever watch Visitor Q? Yeah. 
The movie has an extended breastfeeding scene at the end that's really good. This one That's just... a good movie. We're definitely going to have to watch Visitor Q at some point. Probably, uh, you know, uh, Mike hangs over this this entire podcast like a <laughs> not a dark cloud, but just like he's up there, like the um like the smiling sun in Teletubbies. He's kind of <laughs> always always on our minds and above us, <gasps> casting his That's light, right. dispersing it down. Um, right. let's 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 rewind and sort of broadly set up this film. I feel like it sort of came out of nowhere a little bit, where I had first heard about this movie maybe a month ago. And it was yeah, a you know, trailer dropped like a full three minute trailer. Here's what it is. Here's the new thing from Brandon C. C. in a month, which was like, I was excited about that. I didn't even realize, yeah, that it was that that quick when 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 the tickets went on sale for this bad boy. I was like, sign me up. Yeah. Got to see that joint because Mia Goth yeah. having a moment. She sort of rode out of 2022 on a high horse with uh, Axe and Pearl, which are two really fascinating movies with great performances from her. Did you know she, her? She's married or dating Shia LaBeouf still currently in these days. Yikes is what I'll say about that. Did you know that? Just I didn't know I that. I also recently. saw the images of Shia LaBeouf on the set of the new Francis Ford Coppola movie, um, and there's a lot going on there. That movie's going to be wild. Francis Ford Coppola still alive? He is. Yeah, he's. He's been he's been making wine for over a decade at trying oh, to self fund yeah. his new film Megalopolis and it is now filming and there was the very funny report where they were like they are not filming this movie it's not happening and then Francis Ford Coppola and Adam Driver both came out and they were like we're making the movie it's going to it's going to kick ass I can't wait um to see what happens there Wow, Megalopolis I haven't heard well I definitely thought Francis Ford Coppola had died like 15 years ago so that's news to me. Um, oh yeah, I'm gonna have to read about this Megalopolis. It's like a self-financed passion project, uh, guaranteed to be a time if that movie ever comes out. <laughs> sure. We're all gonna be normal about it. Infinity Pool. In addition to Mia Goth, stars Alexander Skarsgård, another hottie, kind of having a hot moment. The whole Skarsgård clan riding strong right now. But he was in The Northman last year, which he was pretty good in. Not crazy about that movie. I thought it was okay. Yeah. Um, not my favorite Eggers joint, but that's okay. Scar's good as that. What 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 else was he in recently? I'm trying to I feel like he was in something else last year. He was apparently I like his I like his little brother a lot. I don't much care for this Scar's guard. Not to rank scars guards on this podcast, but it's it's yeah. obviously Stellan. And then, well, Bill was in, uh, not like Barbarian. He was great in that movie. Used to a that's the one. Yeah, yes. that's the one I like. He was Pennywise. used so well in that movie because yeah. he's a little fucking freak. He definitely has the freakiest face out of all the scars guards. <laughs> and in yeah. that movie, he's just like the most normal man in the world who throws up oh. like every red flag. And then he was in um Alex was in Godzilla vs. Kong. Best movie of the last ten years. Yeah, was I saw that that's what I was gonna mention. Who who was he in that movie? He's... I literally don't remember a single human character <laughs> in that movie. He's well, I remember the podcasters. I don't think he was a podcaster. He is the top build human yeah. being in Godzilla vs. Kong, above Millie Bobby Brown, above Academy Award nominee Brian Tyree Henry uh and can lance we, reddick and kyle chandler can we make a quick diversion of like big budget triple a if you will films of the last few years is godzilla vs kong the worst written movie of all of them while still being a movie you should watch without a shadow of a doubt because you should watch that movie it's just like its script is unbelievable the bad. the it's one of one of the few movies that understands how perfunctory its like structure is and you can mm -hmm. feel the characters being like fuck like we got to do this so we can set up we're going to the hollow earth uh and there's yeah. a big 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 axe that the monkey's going to get and like oh fucking mecha godzilla uh 
you know, it, it it's a movie that features podcasters in prominent roles, so I always love seeing that. That's we've talked about that <laughs> a felt, little bit. Yeah, felt seen. I felt represented. I felt represented on screen when Godzilla was swimming around those big old boats. I was like, oh, fast, fast boy underwater. I like that. Um, <laughs> movies love putting jokes about podcasters and jokes about kombucha in them these days. We talked about this. If you're, yeah. If you're writing a script right there, right now, out there, shit, uh, you're having trouble connecting the dots making a sale S- sprinkle on some podcast jokes some kombucha jokes a if billion dollars offer, on your front porch tomorrow if i can offer some script writing advice to all the the um struggling script writers and up and coming script writers even out there is uh usually the ticket to success in major motion pictures is Look up whatever was in pop culture news 15 years ago Mm -hmm. and then make that the conceit of all your jokes in your script. You don't want it to be current. Don't not current. But what was was everybody talking about 15 years ago? Podcasters and kombucha. Not putting in your Godzilla vs. Kong, baby. I watched something recently that had like the most outdated joke fuck i forget it was like a song or something it would be like mm. it wasn't this but it would be like watching a movie right now where they talked about Gangnam style it was like that just yeah. appallingly out of touch um or well a facetime movie just came out and it's like face facetime well, we were impressed by that like 10 years ago are you, you, know, talk, are you talking about movie missing FaceTime? searching god that movie i like that actress a lot that main actress that's in euphoria yeah. That movie looks impressively shitty. Oh, it's like, a sequel. It's... it's a sequel to a movie that people really liked that I never saw called Searching. Uh, Megan is missing. Very different film. <laughs> no, well, no, Megan's not missing. She's in theaters right now, and she's slaying. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Also, looks bad. Uh, uh, pretty good. I movie. did listen. Is it? I listened yeah. to the Slate pop cult or what the Slate spoiled about it because I was like, I'm not seeing this shit, and they they seem to like it. So for whatever that says to you. You know what's good about Megan? Very funny kombucha joke in there. Really? Yeah. Like, there's a, um, I guess, very minor spoilers for Megan here. There's, like, a tech billionaire character in there, uh, and he's a dick. Surprise, surprise. But he's, like, berating his assistant. He's having a meltdown because they're trying to Mm. unveil Megan to the public. And he's like, Mm -hmm. Megan goes live in an hour. Like, I'm stressed out. And his assistant's like, what can I do for you? And he's like, you can fuck off and get me a kombucha. And so the guy, like, runs out. And then... While the guy's gone, Megan goes haywire, starts murdering people. Um, there's a very funny scene where she stabs the billionaire guy when he's trying to get in an elevator. Uh, door opens. The assistant's standing there with the kombucha, sees Megan stabbing the guy, drops the bottle of kombucha. I'm like, that's funny. That's what they call a callback, uh, set up punch line. Oh. The other day, I was at Trader Joe's, and the uh, – the, the, uh, Attend the, the the what do they call them the checker outer? Yeah, the, the checker outer. Out. They were having a debate with their coworker, and they she decided to get me involved in it. And I was like, "Lady, I just I just kind of want to go home." Uh, but she was like, "She was like, what about you? You like kombucha?" And I had to be like, "I don't really know what kombucha is." And then she like wrote me into a conversation where she explained kombucha to me. Hmm. And then I didn't know how to get out of it, and I was just kind of stuck there. And then finally, I was like, "I'll take your word for it." And then I walked away. And now I've went on this podcast and made it probably made it sound like I was rude to a employee. Yeah, you, I was out to her. I just didn't really, I just didn't really know what to do in the moment. Well, you know, I was like I've never, I've never had kombucha. You know who could have explained kombucha to you in that Trader Joe's aisle? Me. I used to brew my you. own kombucha. You know that? That doesn't surprise me. Yeah, I used to. Uh, grow it under my sink. You know it's alive. Kombucha's alive. And and all of this, yeah. to be clear, is kind of relevant to Infinity Pool because it's a big organism that you submerge in water and over time it creates well, something else, which is a delicious fruity beverage and not a the, clone of Alexander Skarsgård. The checker outer at Trader Joe's told me it's fermented. It's like alcohol, but it doesn't get you drunk. And I said, oh, I, I, don't, I don't drink. <laughs> alcohol doesn't get me <laughs> drunk because I don't put it inside me. Yeah, that's right. I don't even drink non-alcoholic beer. Well, you know who drinks alcohol? Alexander Skarsgård. Alexander Skarsgård on vacation in the film Infinity Pool. They're in what I believe is a fictional country. They filmed in Croatia, but I believe they made this place up. Um, They're at him and his lovely looking wife, 
not Mia Goth, crucially, um, are are at a at a at a sort of all inclusive resort in a remote European country that's dangerous. So they can't, you know, leave the fenced in area. They want you to eat at all the restaurants that are owned by the resort. Very classic rich person shit. I say, having never had an experience anywhere remotely like this in my life, nor ever will I. Um, but it's like, you know, the white Lotus is having a moment. That sort of, that sort of setup. He is suffering from writer's block. Uh, he's sort of a loser. He wrote a book six years ago that didn't do very well, having a tough time coming up with his next book. His wife is just like, this dude's a slob. My dad hates him. He's worthless. He doesn't do anything. He sits around. He listens to Joe Rogan all day. He's a mess. We're going on vacation to get him some inspiration. Right. They're having a nice time, it looks like, at the start of this movie. Things go south pretty quickly, but it seems like they're doing all right. Um, but they also have a very distant marriage. You know, there is clearly some tension between them. Yeah. One of my bigger sort of issues with this movie is how quickly the wife character basically just disappears once the movie's done with her story whatsoever it's just like yeah whatever and i think there could have been like some interesting twist or a wrinkle to put in there but this is a movie that does not linger on particular concepts or ideas very long it moves pretty quickly and i do think there's like you know a couple movies worth of material in here especially when we kind of get to that first twist that sets up a really complicated moral dilemma that i'm like i would have liked to have seen these two people really go back and forth on this a little bit more, but the movie's like, we got some freakier stuff to move on to. Yeah. And by God, does it get freaky. Yeah. On this vacation, they run into Mia Goth and her husband, who are staying at the same resort, and she is a big fan of Alexander Skarsgård's book. Maybe the only person on the planet who was. Um, And so he's a little smitten. He's a little starstruck. Can you blame him? I mean, if I if yeah. I saw Mia Goth and she was like, "Oh my God, Blake, I loved your review of Ratchet and Clank," <laughs> I'd be like, "Oh my Lord, Mia!" Thank She's like, you. "Yeah, the oral history of Guitar Hero. I love it so much. It was my yeah, favorite right. oral history of all time." Who do you think is the most famous person that's read something? I bet it would surprise either you. of us. Wrote well, Maybe, it would it would be yeah. something you wrote, uh, but I bet it would surprise you. I bet like, yeah, I don't know, somebody cool probably. We, I guarantee it. We talk about this occasionally at work, like, who's the most famous subscriber at Game Informer? Because it's like, we have six million subscribers. Mm-hmm. Just the numbers game alone means at least one of them is probably mega famous. And what I've figured out, not figured out, my theory is no one actually famous subscribes to us, but they do because of their kid. So oh. I think we go to fa- some famous houses, and it's like their kid. And that's not including someone like Reggie fils who is probably a subscriber. Joe Biden. Like That'd be crazy, dude. Yeah, I, I bet that, you know, I bet a Game Informer has entered the White House at some point. Maybe, yeah. yeah, yeah. Occasionally I'll, like, see a Game Informer at someone's house in my day-to-day life. And, and what like, do you say? Do you say, Game Informer? I hardly know her. I hardly know her. No, I say, uh, reading the lamestream media, I see. <laughs> and then I walk out with my middle finger in the air. Both of them. That's right. They... Hang out. They go to dinner at a lovely Chinese restaurant that they were making fun of earlier. Um, and right. then they're like, you know, come join us the next day. We're going to we're going to take this car. We're going to drive outside the fence, which is the one thing at the start of the movie. They're like, hey, you can do whatever you want here. Don't go outside the fence. It's kind of the one thing we tell you not to do. Yeah, we're we're, do that. we're basically we're less than 10 minutes in the movie. They're like we're going outside the fence. Um, mm-hmm. They have a horribly irresponsible time out there. They're just sitting on the beach. Uh, grilling sausages aggressively. Everybody's drinking their own separate bottles of wine. I, it was truly... Look, I think this movie has some things it's trying to say about wealth, privilege, etc. Uh, the the garishness, the vulgarity of their wanton display of, of, of fortune in these early scenes. A little... I was picking up what he was putting down, BC. Um, this is when we get the aforementioned uh cum shot Scar- gotta be the gotta be one of the most unattractive hand jobs in a film of all time it's pretty Mia brutal Goth, yeah 
Mia Goth aggressively walks up behind Alexander Skarsgård while he's peeing. Mid piss. And and not sure about the logistics of this, if he's peeing with an erection or just the idea of Mia Goth behind him uh, gave this, he was able to get it up within 0.2 seconds because he then ejaculates within four seconds. Yeah, I wasn't, it's, I wasn't it, counting. The it timing was, is insane. It was like a, a four stroker, maybe three, four, yeah. five, like pretty quick. From flat, from flaccid to finish. Like midstream to, <laughs> yeah. He shoots are pretty funny. Uh, I know that there's a shot of of the penis missing, but the editing is pretty funny. Where it's just like he's 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 getting red faced and and there aggressive. Are, yeah, it's it's I like cut this down if you need to for the sake of our careers. It's such a whack cum shot. <laughs> like even Sex in the City had a better. Do cum you shot. do you not think that the sort of pathetic nature of it was intentional the very disappointing kind of just physicality of the of the whole setup this very like meaningless sexual encounter that what just it, like okay. truly literally sputters out and fizzles away okay. do you not think that was what the kids call a metaphor okay but the cronenberg family known for being visually impactful filmmakers if nothing else hmm. wouldn't it have been more impactful to see that maybe splatter on <laughs> the door of the expensive car they drove yeah. or maybe an homage to ichi the killer dripping from a leaf somewhere it like spells it, out it's... infinity pool <laughs> that would have been fucking nuts you know what i, I did been the one person in the theater screaming crying come oh, come clapping. come uh, you know what I really did like that we zoomed past um, the like the very first introduction of this movie. I think it's when like the sort of credits are rolling through, but it introduces the resort with these shots where the camera is sort of flying above everything, sort of upside down, and then is is tilting over kind of very slowly. Just a nice like ominous sort of setup to let you know, hey. This might seem like a fun little vacation resort. Things are uh, a little askew and are going to get it, a little crazy. It reminded me very. It reminded me a lot of the opening to Ir- Irreversible, actually, by Gaspar Noé. Indeed, very similar camera pan in that movie. Indeed, and, um, and all of not the similar movies, though, not very different movies. Yeah, all the interstitial titles, like the opening credits and the end credits, which are just those flashing sc- screens of color. Uh, and like mm-hmm. the really unique kind of font design and, and text layouts, I really liked all that. They look great. They look like The Verge's new <laughs> web design. I was like, "What is this? A fucking uh, insider expose on Elon Musk's extremely hardcore Twitter? <laughs> what am I reading here?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or it looked like uh, the out outline. Remember that website? Was that rest it, in peace? That was out- a good site. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that was what a fun it looks one. Like it's that's like the, yeah, the, the uh, you know. Vox Media adjacent podcast experience has the the art direction of of the Infinity Pool closing credits. Yeah, they did the credits in the, the chorus CMS. <laughs> uh, well, after the after the disappointing hand job, they're like, time to drive back to our resort. Mia Goth's husband pulls the classic. I'm too drunk. I can't drive. I'm gonna fall asleep. And Alexander Skarsgård's like, I'm good. I got this. I'm only. A little bit less drunk than you are. As someone who grew up in Kentucky, never, never take, never, never take someone up on that offer. Yeah. It's N- never worth it. N- Sleep in the car. Yeah, no one should be driving that car. I understand that they're, uh, you know, out in a dangerous remote environment. But maybe here's the thing: I don't want to, I don't want to cast judgment or sound too, you know, sound too radical here. Maybe have a designated driver, someone who's not going to drink alcohol when you're out uh, in the dangerous you know, island resort that you're not supposed to leave um, and, yeah. and get stranded. Because do things go well for them on the drive home? They do not. Very dark. Scars guards. Mm-hmm. Scars guard. What a hard word to pronounce very quickly. Yeah. Uh, he's fading in and out on the road. All of a sudden, man trying to cross the street. Uh, boom. Pancaked. He goes flying across the road. He's dead as a doornail. Uh, pretty gnarly. Mm-hmm. Just like they call it. DOA, DOI, dead on impact, dead on arrival. He did not make it to the other side of the street alive. Um, right. They're all like, that's probably not great. We shouldn't have done that. Um, and Mia Goth and her husband are like, 
cannot call the cops, cannot tell anyone. We're driving all the way back. We're going to sleep. We'll deal with this tomorrow. So they try that. They do that. They go back. They're awoken in the middle of the night. Knock on the door. Who's that? Oh, it's the police. Come with us. We just want to talk. Um, mm-hmm. Right. Turns out they don't just want to talk. They want to kill him. They get him there. They're like, look, we know that you did. <laughs> this shit is so fucking crazy. It's both like one of the best moments of satire and also Brandon Cronenberg maybe accidentally being viciously xenophobic uh, where he's like, hey, check it out. We're a, we're kind of a third world country. You know, I know our custom here is like, we're going to execute you. and We're going to have the son of the dude you killed. Come kill you. Whoever is like, all right, yeah. <laughs> shut the fuck up. Whoever the actor who played that like main detective cop was, was really great. A very, yes, like intentionally dripping with satire, but just like a no bullshit straight man kind of being like, <laughs> Here's how things work here. I understand that you accidentally hit someone with your car. We do let his oldest son uh, stab you in the gut to repay, you know, the blood debt that he's owed your family. Uh, If he doesn't have an oldest son, we let his youngest son do it. And if he doesn't have a youngest son, then the government will step in. But good news for you. This guy does have an older son. So you're all good. It's... It's effective satire for sure. It also implies that maybe Brandon Cronenberg thinks this is how some poor countries work which i have not done the research to know if that's not true in some place of the world but it's also like okay the the more you know fantastical elements of of this setup are definitely helped by it like not being a real place because there are those scenes early on too where the resort staff is like oh the rainy season is ending so we're doing this sort of like tribal dance the resort and everybody puts like this this paint on their faces and they're in these elaborate costumes and of course the masks that they sell in the gift shop that become relevant later on uh and then there's that great scene too where like some people break into the resort and drive on the beach on the atvs just to cause trouble just a little just a little prank just a little prank just a little prank speaking of little pranks uh they're gonna kill alexander skarsgård they're gonna stab him in the gut it's about tom yeah someone's someone's got to do it they're like look your dad's better your little brother he was the clown in it you're just not cutting it out <laughs> we're, we're done with you. We're, you your moment is over uh but oh wait a minute we have uh just a little proposition for you You know if you've got the money we can uh maybe sub in an identical clone of you so this kid thinks he's killing you but you know you're all good nothing but respect for this movie introducing this literally insane and stupid concept and be like all right and we're not going to explain it any further. Just fucking deal with it. Audience. Well, yeah, that's what I was talking about earlier where I was like, okay, we get there. This could be another 90 minute movie where it's him and his wife being like, uh, should I go in the titular infinity pool? Should I clone myself? Do I, do I even believe that this is a real thing? Are they gonna, you know, kill me as opposed to the clone? How do I know? They talk about this a little bit later, right? But this kind of dilemma of, like, what does this even mean? But he pretty quickly is just like, throw me in that fucking pool. Clone my ass now. Uh, and then I think, th- what based on what you're just saying, I think all the most interesting ethical and moral ideas this film has, it's actually not very interested in engaging with. Mm. And that made the movie less interesting to me. Because there's a point in this film where they introduce this idea of how traumatic it might or might not be to actually see your own death. Yeah. And it is a really fascinating idea allocated to 20 seconds of this movie. Yeah. And like it does that frequently. I respect that about this movie, about how it pays just enough attention to these concepts to get you really sort of like my – the gears in my brain were basically constantly turning this whole movie of ta- of thinking through like that would be like that's pretty twisted um and rather than you know it 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 could be a different movie that sort of grapples with the philosophy and the morals and the ethics of the entire thing but this i think is a movie that would rather stew in the nihilism and the sort of realities of you know it, what it's clearly doing is sort of setting up this elaborate premise and then basically saying these people whose lives are so empty so meaningless like they could 
be witnessing their own deaths over and over again and have just you know sanded off the edges of their life to a point where death is no longer a thing to fear it's like truly the most minor inconvenience and so it's doing a sort of heavy-handed wealth satire with some really trippy sci-fi elements um i i thought the blend that it that it ends up getting to was really compelling for me to watch at least i'd be curious to see how this holds up on a rewatch because like i mentioned i think the parts that i found really invigorating and exciting in the theater have sort of now that i've cooled on them with some distance i'm like I definitely really liked this movie um but it's not you know like not i'm not buzzing about it Let's let's get a little further into the synopsis because I think we're about to hit my biggest issue yeah. with the film and why I wished it explored its different topics instead. So there's a, a like a deep, you know, maroon pool that they submerge this man in and then yeah, I mean, it works. There's a clone of him tied up. Uh the son walks in. We watch. It's a pretty cool sequence where he gets pretty brutally stabbed. He's bleeding out, and then the camera kind of like pans out to Skarsgård and his wife seated in the yeah. bleachers, basically watching it. And then they're like, "Yeah, you're free to go. You know, you you paid your debt or whatever. You're all good." She freaks out at him, just being like, "How could you watch that? You're you know desensitized, demoralized. We got to get out of here. This is this is fucked." Um, he has conveniently misplaced his passport, so he's like, I can't leave. But it's at this point already where you kind of get the sense where he's like, Did I like did kinda, I did I like that? <laughs> kinda cool. That was kind of cool, cool yeah. <laughs> yeah. I uh I've just learned that I cannot die, essentially. Or, you know, I could die an infinite amount of times. Basically, what the like setup from there ends up being is Mia Goth is like, hey, I know they cloned you. Isn't it pretty cool? We've all been cloned before. There's like a group of us who have done this several times and now we all hang out because we sort of know. And like once you've been through it, people who haven't been through it can't understand it. And that's basically where the wife character, whose name I should remember, like is no longer relevant to the movie at all other than like, isn't your wife such a nag who doesn't want you to uh, do crimes and get cloned and die over and over again? But yeah, the rest of the movie, essentially, and we're probably an hour in at this point. Like, this is probably right around the halfway point where the movie just flips into we're going to follow this group of, of rich fools around and watch them, you know, do clockwork orange style some crazy crimes with no regard for the law, their own well-being. Uh, like they don't care about anybody else they're just like breaking into houses stealing shit destroying stuff breaking the law getting arrested right being cloned getting killed repeats um and that's kind of like you know that the movie does that for like 45 minutes basically why i kind of wish it would have explored its other topics like the the moral and ethical issues of this this system where you you are able to kind of sell your humanity is um I, and i've had pushback on this take before but i certainly don't think i'm alone in it especially the more of these fucking movies we get i'm really sick of movies about how rich people are terrible and evil and bad for the world that come from rich people yeah like well, there... i understand you can make salient points you can make art <laughs> about your own type it also means – it inherently just means less to me, frankly. And, like, this like, – uh, kill your darlings, you know? Like, Parasite, I think, is just as guilty of this. The Knives Out movies, we've seen a slew of these things recently. And, frankly, I'm just, like, very over the idea of Brandon Cronenberg feeling like he is the person to tell me this type of stuff. Because it's like, bro, you're – you're – you're a nepotism baby, like yeah. which I don't think. And I, I think the issue around nepotism babies is a little overblown. A lot of these people are just trying to live their lives. It's not disqualifying. I yeah, I don't want one to tell me that rich people are bad because it's like, you know, the guillotine does not discriminate. You know, like, and so movies like this, the more I see, the more they're kind of 
becoming this in vogue thing and they're becoming a trend frankly it lessens a lot of the impact for me and i just don't think brandon cronenberg has anything unique to say about wealth and the the tragedies of wealth and kind of the evils of wealth yeah that warrants him making a film about his scene and his community of i understand Br- the Cronenbergs are not billionaires, but they also, you know, the, David Cronenberg has probably made a very comfortable life for his children. And that's great. And I, I commend that. David Cronenberg, by all accounts, was a very hardworking individual. And Brandon Cronenberg is a very talented filmmaker who I think deserves to be able to make a movie this high budget with this kind of cast. I just, I'm not interested in that kind of story anymore. I am more interested in this setup. All the same kind of bones that leans into different ideas and explores different philosophical topics than a rich person trying to tell me why other rich people are bad. Cause that's kind of what it is, right? Ryan Johnson's like, no, the other ones are bad. Well, Ryan yeah. Cronenberg's like, I'm good. Cause I can recognize it. And it's like, that's not how it mm-hmm. works. What it's I... like, if I made a movie and was like, Chihuahua owners are bad, <laughs> but not me. <laughs> like, yeah. That way. I-, I think there's an interesting layer to this one where you know, they are obviously wealthy and that helps, mm-hmm. you know, that's how they can afford the cloning and proce- pr- procedure and all that. Um, I think the layer of what it adds on that's maybe more interesting than a movie like Glass Onion or even something like I was thinking a lot about uh, recently Best Picture nominated Triangle of Sadness, a movie that I really loved. Um, sure. And that's, again, not just doing like rich people are bad, but that's sort of skewering like. Uh, the fashion industry and kind of like people who become so wealthy that they have nothing else to do. Um, This movie's playing a lot with the idea of privilege um, because it's a group of like, you know, white American or European tourists on vacation in some sort of remote country where, you know, these people are there, you know, there to serve them um, kind of answer their whims, their beck and call basically converting you know the place that they live into a playground for the rich and famous or richer and famous or what i like about this movie is that his character is not a super successful writer who's like i'm just trying to get off the grid to recharge he's like a sort of struggling artist who maybe a floundering artist even who's just like look i married uh into a rich family and have the opportunity afforded to me to just like take six years to doing big air quotes, write my next book and like, you know, yeah. just go around the world and do cultural tourism for inspiration. Um, and how that whole idea of the, like, you know, uh, privilege, wealth, all that sort of stuff feeds into this, not even like narcissism, nihilism, this idea. Cause that's where it ultimately ends up is just such an utter disregard for their own humanity and how it really mm-hmm. just like grinds that relatability, that communality all away and it's just like you will be you will be in pursuit of the most kind of adrenaline fueled thrills and really just things that remove any sense of you belonging in this society and any responsibilities that you might have are all gone because you have more money yeah. than these people and so it affords you you know x y z in this movie it is the ability to die over and over again and be immune from the law essentially and so that really you know, to your point, I think this is a much more sort of contained story, a very specific setup than it is just that broad, like, rich people are bad. Um, it's like, here's this group of boring rich people who have <laughs> happened into a very, like, you know, Hitman video game-esque premise, <laughs> yeah. and they're just going to fucking, like, go nuts for an hour. And I liked watching it. My... My we- the weakest part of this movie for me were the more fantastical elements. Um, mm. I invoked Ruben Ostland with Triangle of Sadness. Was reminded of mm. all of his movies watching this. I was also definitely thinking of Nick Reffin a lot watching this movie. Oh, sure. uh, I think sure. he he might be owed royalty checks for some of the like dream sequences that happen in this movie, <laughs> which is just uh, red and blue neon pulsating lights with naked women gyrating around very fast cut montages i was like this is uh this is only god forgives too at some at some points and so those bits 
the parts, yeah, where it started to, like, bleed over into the psychedelic and the sort of blurred line of reality and, and dreams, that felt like a layer on top that I was just not into. Like, you know, it all looked cool and whatever. There was a warning before the movie that was, like, uh, if you're sensitive to, you know, epilepsy or, or photosensitivity in any mm-hmm. way, this is not the movie for you. And so I was like, <laughs> yeah. okay, where where is that going? Um, and I think those sequences were honestly just kind of nonsense basically just sort of like you know extra flash and panache just to have something cool on the screen they didn't do much for me i don't know how you felt about those bits they honestly like i think i would have been really into them if i hadn't seen possessor because they feel almost like a carbon copy of scenes of possessor like 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 ah you've already done this and it was really cool the first time i saw it now it just kind of feels like you're trying to make it a trademark thing this movie has gotten a more mixed reception maybe than I was expecting. I feel like that trailer came out, I was pretty excited for it, but you know, just the nature of like film hype online these days is just like, oh, this thing's going to be crazy. It was almost rated NC-17. It's the new Cronenberg joint. Like you're going to shit and piss and cry in the theater. And then people started seeing it and were like, oh yeah pretty fun nice time at the movies a little twisted um yeah so that that's interesting to see too where it's like maybe some of these surface surface level aesthetics are not just like making instant classics the way they used to the the one uh sequence in this film i do want to talk about that i thought was just fucking awesome is towards the end when um alexander skarsgård character Alexander Skarsgård's character um, decides to break away from the group when he is tricked into killing himself. Again, interesting concept, like what it, what it was explored here. What I had thought. Um, let, let's let's rewind just a little bit. Okay, to, sure. to set that up, because I think another sequence that I really liked happens right before that, where, um, or no, maybe that's after that. But uh, is that when they all kind of? There's a really great little twist where Skarsgård gets taken back and they're like, you can't afford the cloning procedure this time. We're just going to kill you. Um, and then it, it leads you to believe that he's getting killed. And then the rest of them are all there. And then it pans yeah. out again. And they're all in As the crowd really watching moment. that. I love that. Yeah. bit. Um, Very good moment. But this, this part you're talking about is like, Oh, we're going to this house party. Uh, we're going to, we're going to kidnap the cop. Um, and we're going to bring him and you can get, you know, your revenge because he was such a dick to you. And he's like, okay, that's fine. That's cool. So they're like, you watch the car. We're going to run in, grab him. They pull him out with a bag on his head. They bring him back to the party. They rough him up. They beat him up. They're like, you know, have fun. Go nuts with this guy. Uh, he's kicking him, stabbing him, whatever he's doing. They, they pull the bag off. I was expecting it was going to be his wife. Uh, movie goes in a different direction. It's another Skarsgård clone. Pretty funny. Good little mm. trick. Um, you were expecting the Serbian film ending. I was. Sorry to evoke that one. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, tune in next week for a Serbian film. Ah, uh, come on. We, the, the, enough has been uh, written about truly, that Truly, that's, that's one movie where I think everything that, anything that anyone could ever say about that movie has been said. No more. There's, there's a documentary coming out about it I'm pretty interested in. It's also been supposedly coming out for like, years at this point Hmm. but that'll probably be the last thing we need to say about it it's like oh so that's what happened that's how it was made pretty cool but but that basically and that that encounter inspires Skarsgård to uh get out of the game right that's when he's like i'm done i've had enough it's it's a cool idea right because he doesn't really it's, it's maybe a little rote but like he doesn't seem to acknowledge the kind of the crimes he's committing to others until it's self in, in quotes i guess self-inflicted yeah. right he he's really troubled by the idea of hurting himself even though like it doesn't actually hurt him and another yeah. clone can be made he's well, very scared at the idea of hurting we himself in the flesh we've been using the word clone cloning cloned the entire time i think the movie very explicitly kind of avoids using that as much as it can i think the word they use is double for most of it right Mm -hmm. like we can make a double they're not specific about the process but you know it is shorthand for for cloning and so the like the moral implications of the whole thing are not particularly at the forefront of the movie which again i found pretty interesting because yeah what if you treated 
this concept that in reality is like cannot even grapple with it uh i got steam coming out of my ears just thinking about it what if you were just like oh sorry guys can't come to the dinner party tonight you know i gotta i gotta pop in for a quick cloning sesh it's kind of out of the way gonna take like 15 minutes traffic's gonna be fucking bad at the cloning station so i gotta it's gonna you know it's gonna take a whole yeah a whole a whole thing (laughs) like i i liked that element of the movie how it was just again introduces it up front and it's just like yeah so we got that going on uh we're moving forward yeah um scar's guard tries to run away and we learn you do not leave the family yeah once you remember you do not leave and we get this sequence of him trying to he gets on a bus he's gonna take me to the fucking airport get me away from these people and lo and behold he's on the bus the convertible rolls up and there's Mia Goth with a fucking gun, and she's like, "Oh, oh, oh no, 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 no!" She I just starts. Not. She just starts blasting. So, so, so Mia just started blasting, yeah. and man, it leads to this unhinged, honestly, reminiscent of Harley Quinn. <laughs> like she just goes full unhinged. That's when this movie toward... becomes the Mia Goth show. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's incredible. She's. They they pull in front of the bus. They've stopped it, and they're like, "Look, everyone on that bus, we don't give a shit about you. We just want James." And Mia is screaming Screeching, maniacally yeah. at the top of her lungs, "Jamesy, Jamesy!" Holding the you've seen in the fucking trailer. yeah, it's fucking. This is awesome. why you hire Mia Goth to be in your movie. It's yeah, it's it's an amazing sequence and leads to. They, <laughs> James is like, "All right, I'll get off this fucking bus." He has a moment of humanity. Don't hurt the other people here. And they just make him march down this road for God only knows how long while Mia holds a gun at his back and kind of reveals like. Never liked your book. She's reading negative reviews of it to him. Yeah. She pulls out a printed piece of paper and reads a negative review, which uh, was really funny. And just is like, you know, I I just Googled you and you seemed like an easy mark. And we decided to make you like one of our little puppets for a weekend and you can't get away. And Alex is like, I'm going to run away anyway. Let's let's talk about because we have skipped over this a little bit. The we, the they, in there. Like it's obviously mm. Mia Goth and her husband, but this whole group is again just like it's important to sort of acknowledge that yeah, they are just a collection of sort of well-off tourists, and they've basically turned this into their hobby. Um, they're they're killing, they're having orgies, they're doing this stuff all the time, and like kind of the the way I understood it is it's like they kind of make this their like summer vacation every year where it's like they're coming back and just like oh we're going to the cloning island you know yeah. there's the there's the rainy season so we can't be there then whatever but like oh i'll see you at um clone murder sex summer camp it's, next year i mean it's it's very reminiscent of like i guess things people don't really like to talk about but obviously exists and that's kind of sex tourism yeah where people go to a country like cambodia or other very, you know, damaged countries by war or d- dictatorships, whatever the case might be, uh, where laws are maybe implied at best and effectively take advantage of the local communities there uh, and a bunch of nefarious things I don't really want to talk about. But the movie is hinting at effectively sex tourism and it's replacing s- most of the sex with violence. Yeah, I I, I think the, you know, social commentary, however deep it runs in this movie, I think it's handled pretty well. Again, like, that's what I liked about this movie more so mm. than the, like, horror kind of body morphing sequences of it all. Is like, I really liked the just, like, nitty gritty kind of crime hard sci-fi setup of this thing. That's what I definitely dug the most. And so, yeah, all yeah. that plays into it for sure. Um he he runs he he does end up escaping from them after they they're walking him on a leash uh and yeah he runs to like this farm that is maybe the farm of the family that he killed up front not really super relevant cuz they pull up and they're just like here's your What's clone <laughs> we're going to make you yeah. fight yourself nude um it's pretty awesome yeah. i mean there's a lot of uh it's a pretty loaded sequence. There's a lot. There's a lot going on there where it's like, uh, can you can you conquer your own nude clone uh, to yeah. to kind of impress your new mother slash 
wife figure the truly a loaded sequence and this is where we get that bit where when Skarsgård kills the clone of himself uh Miagoth then breastfeeds him uh with his own blood with his own clone's blood which is like we've all been there that's a normal thing to see in a movie every time I see that I'm like oh I know I know what they're getting at here with this mm-hmm. bit yeah mm-hmm. just like yeah. a truly kind of at this point it's a little bit of like a played out visual metaphor I'm like I get it I've seen so many blood breastfeeding sequences in movies before come on now doesn't something shoot out of the nipple it's it's very uh that's earlier in the yeah film. that's earlier yeah during uh ex- during an orgy scene which honestly fucking went for it it was a crazy scene i was watching this uh in suburban minnesota where i got a few looks for wearing a mask in the building um... and i was like I, don't, I think some of the audience in this theater is not liking the uh gay sex on screen currently i um, love a lot of a lot of a lot of toe sucking too i think mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um oh yeah i definitely was the person who was laughing uh at inappropriate moments in this screening people were like <laughs> "Ooh, gross and i was like that's pretty fucking sick i don't that's know what crazy. to tell you I, I can't wait till blake sees this one <laughs> yeah um i i think the most nihilistic part of the movie comes immediately afterwards which is the ending sequence um, oh we haven't even talked about and, i mean i'm sure you're gonna bring it up the fucking urns when they make the clones right they give you the urns and there's a great yeah. gag here at the end where you alexander skarsgård over the film just accumulates more and more and then we see three urns he's getting ready end. to like leave the island yeah and he's like i can't fit these fucking urns yeah. in my suitcase <laughs> yeah bringing them with him um and despite what they put him through, you know, this this torture at the end that you cannot leave us or this island type thing. The next day, everyone's going home, yeah. Skarsgård included. Then they all just ride the bus together. Skarsgård very, very quietly is, you know, he's not saying anything to the rest as they're all kind of having menial small talk about, like, oh, you know, who's dog sitting for us? Or I think I'm going to do some, some home improvement when we get home. Yeah. And I mean, it's, this is it's like the thesis of the film essentially right like yeah it's it's a very good moment of one trauma like Skarsgård and and it's not in in the sense that like you pity Mm Skarsgård because you should hate him by the end of the film I think that is the point is to hate him hate all of them hate this bus full of people right but in this moment the most empathetic character is Skarsgård because he's clearly traumatized by what he has done and what has been done to him. No, not by what he has done, actually. I, I dispute that myself there. He's traumatized by what's been done to him. I don't think he feels bad about anything he did to others. He, but like he, he's, he's the only one who in. maybe has humanity left. And he's sure. he has the entire movie been struggling with towing the line of losing his humanity. There's like some point of yeah. dialogue in there where Mia Goth is like, you know, you are a creature let's find out like what kind of creature you are essentially because these people are truly beyond the pale they're just monsters and he was definitely like having fun and enjoying or at least curious about what was going on there Mm. but yeah at the end of the day he kind of made the choice that was like this is this is fucked up i want out of here um there's the whole the like the whole drug smoking thing where they're like oh this will be inspiration for your book which again very loaded kind of cultural Mm -hmm. tourism at play there but again those just led to kind of the weird dream sequences that i didn't really care for so not the not the strongest and then um he gets to the airport he has traded his humanity there's no one left to love him his wife is expecting him at home but he sits in the terminal until it's empty and then we see he has returned to the summer home of mia goth and her husband implying that he has decided to stay here forever sitting in the rain i um i took the ending basically to be a little more up in the air no pun intended as he's in an airport but basically to not literally mean logistically he stayed there but that mentally uh he will never oh sure. get away from that experience and it's sure. kind of like in in as many ways his life is essentially over you know Sure, um, yeah. but you know, it was a thinker of an a thinker of an ending. I liked it a lot. So, one one note to bring up that I just uh, didn't didn't get find a chance. Uh, the only sympathetic character in this film, whatsoever, is Alexander Skarsgård, Skard's wife. Yep, who basically absent for the majority of the film. 
Um, but the only character you you might have any inkling of a positive feeling to, for is a nepotism baby, which I just thought was a curious choice by Brandon Cronenberg. He's like, well, this one's good. Like, I know her dad is famous, but trust me, she's cool. She, people with famous dads are fine. Yeah, like, it's no, fine. having a famous dad is totally chill. Yeah, he tried to throw us off the scent of the rich person making a rich people are bad movie, but you can't see, th- I, you can't get one past me, Brandon. Here's what I'll say, and I hope his daddy's not listening. Like this movie a lot more than Crimes of the Future. Oh, Crimes of the Future sucks. Oh my Look, lord, this that's is a bad movie. I did, I didn't care for it, and I know you would. That's a bad. You movie. and I are like maybe the only two people on the planet who didn't care for that movie. Oh, it sucks. God, it sucks. Like it, and again compared to this one, that movie has like i don't know i don't want to harp on it too much i kind of got what that movie's idea was in the first five minutes and then at the end of the movie it was like check this out and i was like yeah okay <laughs> i mean that's how i kind of felt about the... <laughs> did you hear that weird burp did you swallow your gum <laughs> no 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 uh that's how i've kind of felt about this movie is like okay this is what this is well Brandon C, he makes some wild shit. That'll at least be fun. And it just, it never clicked with me. Yeah, I didn't think. I didn't see where it was going. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, I think once I kind of knew what the the, the shtick was, it's just like, like I said earlier, I'm just kind of over this this trend of rich people are bad movies. Mm. That it's like, I think, unfortunately, it was just kind of doomed to not land with me and it unfortunately didn't whatsoever except for that scene towards the end with mia goth uh going fucking ballistic in that car yeah that was awesome i think this one does a lot more with its wealth satire i like sure. i really like the sci-fi elements that it introduces and i think that puts it mm-hmm. above most of the films in this kind of crop uh I, sure. I I okay. recommend it. It's definitely worth a watch. Um, at the very least, I don't think you would be bored with it. Are we doing? Are we? Do we have any? Uh, are we doing some movie recommendations based on this one? Yeah, shit. There was stuff I was thinking of. I mean, obviously, talked about Triangle of Sadness. Talked about the Refn movies. God, what? Um. Oh, 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 oh. You know what? This movie made me think of a lot. What's up? little motion picture called kill list Ooh, that's a fucking good movie yeah god right? that's a good movie well you don't like that movie do you uh not as much as you not as much as this uh, one but again sure. sort of that thing where it is like a a sort of slow burn on a very interesting premise that goes some places <laughs> yeah and again I don't like, like the end yeah, you I don't would... like the end of Kill List, but man, the first two thirds of that film I think goes so hard. Yeah, you and I have the exact opposite opinion. <laughs> where I'm like, <laughs> oh, God, that the first hour of that movie kind of a, sno- a snooze, but then the last no. half hour we're cooking with gas. Um, no. Ben Wheatley's really yeah, he's he's another guy I was thinking of a lot. I'm glad I remembered that because it was just like you know he's working in that mil- that same sort of milieu of movies that feel approachable modern Mm -hmm. have some really sharp twists and turns that kind of make you think which is a which is a a term that sucks these days but they 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 do make you think um i think that's gonna be my recommendation too then i don't know a parasite i guess (laughs) watch another movie kind of in the same vein (laughs) triangle of sadness I think Rocks is... I haven't seen that one. Yeah, I'm very happy that that did get nominated for Best Picture. I love Ruben Osland, and people Mm -hmm. are over his whole thing now because it is the, like, rich people bad sort of thing. But uh, he does it very interestingly. Triangle of Sadness, look, not... Actually, I was going to say I did not see a lot of movies last year that featured extended vomiting and shitting sequences, but I kind of did. Vomiting and shitting, having a moment. I mean, if you're me, you're seeing that all yeah. the time. It's but I mean, like, going to the theater to watch uh, a new release, yeah. an Oscar-nominated film. Like, I think there are, like, four or five movies nominated for Oscars this year that heavily feature vomiting and shitting. I can give you some recommendations for more if you want. <laughs> okay. Fire away! <laughs> uh, 
oh, you know, all the standbys. I'm, I'm going to stop while I'm ahead of myself here. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I guess Eyes Wide Shut. <laughs> <laughs> like maybe that one. That'd be a fun No, watch Kill List. That movie rolls. We should do an episode on Kill List. Yeah, we should. I Have you that... seen any other Wheatleys? Uh-uh. No, His no, stuff no. is good. I His stuff not. is really good. Um, Yeah, man. Well, okay. This is the sort of first batch of region free we will not be talking about new movies very often but sometimes we will so stay tuned uh but we got some banger episodes coming up in the can want to talk about the ones that we've recorded already blake to give people a little sneak preview of what's coming uh to their podcast catcher of choice in the next few weeks oh sure let's see we we did an episode on the wonderful world of conoco mm-hmm. um a personal favorite the more i see it Good and think about it flick just a fucking banger um we did also triad underworld i'm not saying these in order so i apologize we did triad underworld which i also didn't care for but aj did super like and i liked hearing you talk about it quite a bit aj and then what else did we do? Horror is a malformed man. Coming up maybe next. Good, get excited for that a one. Good double feature. Yeah, they would be. Yeah, feature, if you right? like, if you like fucked up things happening on islands by the ocean, buddy, mm-hmm. buckle up. That's right. And at the time of recording, Ricky O coming up next. But yes, listener, you're gonna have to wait about yeah, a month. You're gonna have to wait month, about though. a month. I scheduled all of our episodes this morning, and I was like, a month, because we're smart. Let's go. Yeah. Because we're smart. Because we're smart. We're smart. But uh, yeah, that's what's coming up. And then, I mean, we won't give it away now. We got some, we got some uh, hot shit planned for, you know, month two, season two of Region Free. We're going uh, extreme, let's just say. How you feel about Francois? Francois! Yeah. Yeah, crack a croissant and uh, listen to... You don't crack a croissant. You kind of do. Um, region free. You tear a croissant. Reagan, tell the people thanks for listening. She'd be a bashful. You think of it as a gift. It's like a new skin working into place. It's for you to complete your transformation. This is just a little game. But I can take some blood. Yeah! Show me how strong you are. It's really disgusting. Just sit there and watch it happen. You know, James, do you worry they got the wrong man?